The way Far From Home opens up is a little on the cringe side. The touching tribute to the late members of the Avengers is done with well-meaning intent, but I think something other than the late Whitney Houston's cover of Dolly Parton's I Will Always Love You would have been a more prudent selection. Had it been done to the tone of Michael Jackson's Gone Too Soon, probably would have been more appropriate as the message is in the title, Gone Too Soon. It was a nice callback to see some of the imagery honouring Tony Stark from Iron Man 1. The majority of this sequel sees Peter trying to enjoy some downtime with a class trip to Europe, but unfortunately Nick Fury and company decide to include themselves as Parker had been ghosting Fury. One of the subplots of this movie that I think the writing handles well is how Peter is viewing himself in how he's trying to live up to what Tony was as Iron Man and how much he misses him. One shot that really hits home is where he's sat on a rooftop and he sees a graffiti image of Iron Man and you see Peter somewhat emotional in knowing that his mentor figure is gone. The writing involving Michelle this time around was a lot better. She's still obnoxious, but here her character has softened a little and is likeable as opposed to last time where you just wanted her out of the movie. An interesting choice in choosing Mysterio as the main antagonist and staying faithful to his comic book backstory but tweaking it so it suits the modern story where he is an expert in holography and somehow being yet another person that got screwed over by Tony Stark. I swear if people got screwed by Tony as often as they claimed they'd have struck oil by now. Folks, I'm not a fan of calling the spider sense the Peter Tingle. I'm sorry, I don't care if some people think it's cute, this is pure cringe. It's the kind of thing your mom would say. Now, it may be said with well-meaning, but the execution was less than perfect. Kind of like the current direction of the MCU. Not sorry. Other subplots I thought were good was how much closer Happy and Peter were, and how they both missed Tony. Which leads to a nice moment where we see Peter assembling a new suit, and to Happy it's like seeing Tony back with them as he sees Peter as a young Tony with how innovative and intelligent he is. Where I feel the movie loses some point is where it's repeating beats from the previous movie where Peter screws up by handing Edith to Beck after Tony handed it to him. Now, I'm all for the character learning something new, but it feels like he purposely has to screw up. And that's a big repetitive problem with the MCU, it's rinse and repeat. You don't change the end goal, you just change the formula. But again, if Marvel and Disney had done that, then Disney Plus wouldn't be losing subscribers like WWE was losing ratings under the old regime. Zeppelin. Oh, hell no! Okay. Because Peter's 17 by this point and whose knowledge of classic heavy metal and hard rock is limited, I'm gonna let this slide. But to anyone else... Ooh, you better believe that's a bad one. The final battle is decent in how Peter uses his wit and his spider sense to read between the lines and take out the drones and reclaim Edith, and leaving a massive mess in London. The movie ends on a cliffhanger with the return of JJ and a superimposed video of Beck revealing Spidey's identity to be Peter Parker. All in all, a good movie, but would have been infinitely better if they adopted for new angles and not repeating the formula of Peter screwing up and making amends at the end. Also, it feels like a weird place to end Phase 2 of the MCU, when that should have ended with End Game. His fifth appearance as the Webhead, as he's grown more into it as he had been in two Avenger sequels, one Captain America movie and his own solo movie. So by this point he had gotten to know his role as Parker more, and he does seem more comfortable being a quirky, intelligent and socially awkward teenage superhero. He really displays the emotional weight well with his mentor no longer there and he has to step up in Iron Man's absence. Probably one of the best Spider-Man rogues yet on film. The movie has you rooting for him for a good portion of the flick and then when it's revealed he cons Parker out of Edith, then you begin booing him like he retired Undertaker at Wrestlemania like Roman Reigns did. Fun fact worth knowing, had Tobey Maguire not recovered from his back injury in time for Spider-Man 2, we would have seen him as Peter Parker Spider-Man. 
but Maguire did recover in time and we got the best Spider-Man movie at that time. Favreau reprises his role again and he's lightened up a little here as there's a subplot of him and May being a couple which caught me off guard to begin with, but after a while, I shipped it. He plays off of Holland well as the two have a heart to heart when they share their grief in missing Tony. A lot more likeable this time around where she puts in a good performance as someone who actually likes Peter and not just being the token snark girl from the last movie. Like Holland, he's a lot more settled in his role and it was interesting to see him and Betty Brant be a couple after he made a song and dance to Peter how they were bachelors in Europe and they should take advantage of this. And after the flight from New York to Italy, they're all lovey-dovey, in which I think Peter's facial expression spoke for all of us. Sam's first time in a Spider-Man movie, marking his sixth appearance in the MCU overall. He does well as the gruff, no-nonsense former leader of S.H.I.E.L.D., and I think he has less time for Parker than he did with Stark shenanigans. But then again, he was dealing with a teenager that didn't know when to stop talking. Mind-blowing. But as I mentioned with Homecoming, this is an MCU movie, so you know you're getting top dollar for effects. I think the most standout visual shots are the deceptive illusions that confuses Spidey as much as it did for the audience. You go from one location to the next seamlessly, like you're dimension hopping. And of course, the visual effects with the suits are decent, as to see how Spidey's eyes react tells the audiences what he's thinking, so I'm glad that aesthetic was carried over. Michael Giacchino returns for composing duties and he knocks it out of the park again as he usually does. The action sequences are done well, but it's the tender moments where Peter is missing Tony at the beginning and where he and Happy are showing their respective grief. Well, if that's me, Happy, I'm not Iron Man. You're not Iron Man. You're never going to be Iron Man. Nobody could live up to Tony. It's the emotional weighted scenes that help tell the story of what Tony meant to them and how his absence is heavily felt in the scenes. So the music, it scores another home run. The movie grossed a worldwide profit of 1.132 billion against a budget of 160 million. After only five years, Spider-Man Far From Home's profit would now be worth 1.382 billion dollars. By the end, this Spider-Man really does find his tingle, yet coming in after Into the Spider-Verse with its swirling psychedelic imagery and identity games and trapdoors of perception, Spider-Man Far From Home touches all the bases of a conventional Marvel movie. It doesn't take you out of this world, but it's good enough to summon the kick, or maybe just the illusion, of consequence. From Variety's Owen Gleiberman. Writing for the Chicago Sun-Times, Richard Roper gave the film 3 out of 4 stars, calling it zesty, sweet, and satisfying, and praised the performances of the cast. John Anderson of the Wall Street Journal praised Holland and Zendaya's performances, but described the film as a visually incoherent, effects-heavy superhero movie, and called the dialogue dire. Tom Holland would return for the second sequel and the third Spider-Man MCU movie in Spider-Man No Way Home in which the audience saw the return of iconic villains and the return of Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield. The movie has been enjoyed since 2019 on DVD, Blu-ray, and 4K. I'm MJ Knight, and this was Spider-Man Far From Home. For the first time ever, Real Features covers an event of generations colliding. Classic villains, two legendary heroes return, three Spider-Men, one amazing story. Spider-Man No Way Home, coming soon, only on Real Features.